welcome to, to Keith. <laughs> We've already welcomed everybody else. <laughs> it's good to join together. And it would, I think, be appropriate to say that in many parts of the world, people can't even meet in groups as big as this out of fear for their lives. And I do pray <clears throat> that the word I believe God has given me, it weighs heavily on me uh, much of the time, but this in particular. And similarly, I've been asked at fairly short notice to preach at uh, Wigginton next Sunday morning. And I'd be grateful if you would just remember that in your prayer. Um, because they are short in numbers as well, very often. And uh, I think it's a needful thing. Nothing that I say tonight, or next week for that matter, is new. It isn't a new revelation from God. It's all in here, in his word. But I'm not alone. Other people yeah, have the same problem. And that is, we forget. And we take things for granted. And we do things our own way. When we're supposed to be about the Lord's work, we're doing it his way. So I pray that tonight and for next week, that we will be sensitive to what God's word says. Because it isn't my words that are important. It's important that we really take to heart what God's word says. There are familiar passages tonight. Many people throughout the world would be able to say, ah, yes, <clears throat> and quote the whole chapter. But that's not the point. It's we need to take it to heart and understand what the scripture is saying to us. We have two readings. The first one is from John chapter 3. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, or teacher, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen and you do not believe our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God we thank the Lord for his precious word I want to address today the fundamental challenge of the gospel and there are really two aspects to it one is the very obvious one that the gospel is being presented to people who don't know what it's about and they've got to be made sure that they understand it their need of the savior it isn't about joining a club it's about a matter of life and death but the other is something which is for centuries generally speaking has been ignored the early church certainly didn't ignore it we know that the believers in places like China Iran don't ignore it which is why the church is growing You see, the church is the people. It's a living thing. It isn't bricks and mortar. And this living thing needs to be renewed. The next generation brought on. And what has happened is the serious command that we see in Scripture is being ignored. In most churches, you will find they aren't even giving, nodding a cent to it. I'm sorry to say. And yet if you challenge them, they will agree that that's what the Bible says. And I will just conclude this, these introductory comments by reminding you of a little incident that happened with Jesus and his disciples when he said to them you call me Lord, Lord and I am why don't you do what I tell you it's exactly the same with this the challenge of the gospel now, firstly the nature of the challenge and Satan I know very well and I expect most Christians do does not want us to spread the good news concerning salvation through Jesus Christ alone and particularly in a country which has a reputation as England has of being reserved and stiff up a lip and all this sort of thing it wasn't particularly unusual if you raised spiritual matters the reply you would get was oh I know what I believe and that would be the end of the, the conversation or something similar but basically speaking they didn't want to listen but equally 
after a few of these sort of encounters, I suspect many people were put off, even raising the subject. But God didn't tell us to be picking and choosing who we talk to. He gave us a command, and we'll come to that very shortly. Our enemy, Satan, has his tactics for keeping us from witnessing to God's saving grace, the good news of forgiveness of sins to those who repent and turn from their sin and receive Jesus Christ as their saviour, their personal saviour. It's a personal faith. Now, if we just pause there, yeah, Satan cannot stop us. We don't do it because we choose not to do it. And we've got to face up to that. And if anybody says, is anybody guilty in this room? I am guilty of it. I can tell you that now. I shudder, literally, when I say, if I can just think back over the years of how many times I didn't speak when I should have. And was that the last time that person would hear it? And yet, I have to say this, on occasions, it has been the other person who has actually raised the spiritual question. I haven't had to introduce the matter, they have. And some of them have been the most unlikely people to have done it. And they've opened up. And you knew very quickly what the problem was. And one of them said this to me. He said, I wish I could believe. It's very interesting because he was a man who was lost. I've never had any news that he repented at all. But what he said actually ties up exactly with Scripture. John's Gospel tells us that no one can come to faith unless the Father draws him. I didn't elaborate on uh, to him, but although he was a clever man, he was completely ignorant of spiritual things. So you have to go and take it in simple stages. I was grateful for that opportunity because it taught me a few lessons about who is in control. It's Almighty God. This man raised the question. The thing is that God intended all people to be able to hear the good news, the message of which we're supposed to bring. And it is the duty of believers to proclaim that message. It is a terrible situation that has for centuries blighted the true church, the body of Christ. Now, in speaking to a wide audience of this message, I will just emphasize something which is well known to Christians, and yet in spite of it being well known, we still seem to be wired in the brain to thinking of the church. Yeah, the, the, but it's not the building, it's the people. The church, the true church, are the people who have been redeemed out of this world by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And how? Because they repented of their sin and asked Jesus to forgive them. It's as simple as that. 
And yet, a message so simple is a stumbling block for so many. The church, the true church, to so many people, even has a denominational context. The our church. And more important than biblical truth. And in some, they have deviated from what the scripture says. The scripture talks about overseers and deacons as regards the running of the church. The overseers dealing with the spiritual side, the deacons dealing with the practical duties around the place. It's all well ordered simply because that was God's way. But they introduced another group of people called priests. When we look in the New Testament, when it comes to a person in charge of a church being called a priest, we'll search in vain. There are only two mentions of priest in the New Testament. One of them is in the sense of Jesus as our high priest. And you can read that, of course, in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 to 10. But also, the Apostle Peter referred to the priesthood of all believers. It's a sobering thought that true believers are serving as priests. Who to? To God himself. But as for a, a job, and I'm not ridiculing anybody, I'm being perfectly serious, where they wear special clothes and put their collar round the other way, there's no mention. No mention at all. There were priests in the Old Testament, but that side of things, when Jesus came, he fulfilled all the prophecies concerning him that to date, and there are still the others until he comes again in glory. So in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, and <coughs> Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 to 10, we see what the Bible says about this. But that's just one particular thing. You see, the scriptures themselves make it quite clear that the real description of the local leaders as to what they do is akin to what was common to most people in most places in the world because they were agricultural people, even in this country. And the allusion was to the shepherd. We find the main example of this in John chapter 10 and verses 1 to 18. And that is the parable of the good shepherd. And Jesus nails it when he talks about, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd looks after his sheep. So that was a basic principle. It's frequently translated, is the, the, the word in the scripture, uh, in the translations, as a pastor. And a lot of people object to it. But the point is, the word pastor has its basis in the word pastoral. And if you look up the word pastoral, you will find that it refers to shepherds looking after sheep, goats, and cattle. So... I don't see any problem with it. We have our likes and we dislikes. Um, I'm easy with it. But the point is 
the concept of a priest is rather different in that a priest has to have something to sacrifice. And with us, as believers, our high priest has already paid the debt. The sacrifice has been made. And when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we are not uh, having a sacrifice again as it is referred to in the Roman Catholic Church, the sacrifice of the Mass. That is not right. We are remembering. We are remembering in those emblems. We have to do it seriously because in taking them, they are representing the body and blood of Christ. They are not changed in any way. They are still bread and wine or whatever we're using. But it's essential that we are clear in our mind what is all going on. Another problem which occurs in the churches, and it troubled me from not long after I became a believer, which was in 1962, so I've had rather a long time to think about it. And it still troubles me. And it's when people invite other people to come to our church to hear the gospel. And I cringe sometimes with it. I don't think they've thought about what they're saying. You're asking people to come to the church you go to, the building you go to, their meaning, to hear the minister, the shepherd, the overseer, or deacon, or whoever it is, preach the gospel. Why? Because it is the responsibility of every believer to witness. There's one word which, or one part of a verse which comes from the Old Testament. Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 30. And it says this, he or she who wins souls is wise. It wasn't talking about the priesthood at the time of Moses and that. He was talking about the people. The ones who look to win souls for the Lord are wise. That is the basis for it. But in Matthew's Gospel, in chapter 28 and verse 19, we have in these, the closing part of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says, Go and make disciples of all the nations, that means the Gentiles as well, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, just to clarify something here, just baptizing somebody does not make them a Christian. Baptizing them is what is done after the person has become a believer, has become a Christian, a person who is now born again, and it is a witness to what has happened. You don't splash water on or put them under a, a, a supply of water to make them a Christian. Only the blood of Jesus Christ, which comes upon a person when they have acknowledged their sin, repented, and asked Jesus to save them, that is what makes a person a Christian. And Jesus said, those who come to me, I will in no wise cast out. Go 
and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we'll come back to that verse shortly. Looking at this, if one had to sum it up, we could only say one thing. It is our job to witness. It is our job to reach the lost. Now, you might well say, is, is there a catch in it? Well, the first thing is that Satan has to be behind the idea that it's somebody else's job. It isn't. It's a satanic lie. It's each one of us is responsible for spreading the good news. If you find somebody who is very keen on sport and they come to work on the Monday morning and their team has achieved something, you can almost be certain that they'll be wanting to tell people. Well, if that's what it's like for earthly things, how much more if believers who are on their way to heaven should want to tell people the good news that Jesus Christ alone can save. And it is received by repentance, that's turning away from sin, and asking him to forgive us. And he says he will never turn anyone away. Sometimes Satan will try a personal tactic that uh, oh, we haven't got enough knowledge of the Bible. They might ask a question and we can't answer it. Or we, you might be embarrassed. Friends, if we are born again, God will give us the ability in learning scripture, and presenting the scripture if we just entrust it to him. God never puts us in a situation where we're going to flounder. And if in a particular case we cannot immediately say what the answer is, it's no good waffling. The answer is quite simple. Just say, I'll find out and I'll, I'll let you know. And it may be a minister or for another friend, Christian friend, uh, can help us to clarify it. You see, when God calls us, and throughout this scripture this has been true, he has never put somebody into a position and then just walked away and let them get on with it. When God called Noah to build the ark. And I use that word advisedly because it was not a boat. And very often you'll see imaginary pictures of Noah's ark and it looks like the um, bottom of a Spanish galleon, bulbous nose and all that. It was not. And an ark is a box. It couldn't go anywhere by itself. It didn't have any sails. It didn't have any oars. It was entirely dependent on where God put it or allowed it to go. But when God called Noah, Noah had to build this ark. But he didn't just tell him to build an ark and then leave him to it. He was precise in what he wanted. It took an awfully long while. And it is the same with believers. We, those who are called out, the ecclesia, when we are born again, God doesn't just treat us as robots and let us get on with it. He is there involved with us for the rest of our lives. 
And before he calls us to do something, he will make sure that we have the empowering of his Holy Spirit to do it, whatever it is. It's probably a very good verse to remember in the first letter of the Apostle John and chapter 4 and verse 4. And it says this, He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And that simply means that the Holy Spirit which comes into us the moment we are saved, he is involved in our being born again. We have the Spirit indwelling in us. The Spirit who is in the world is Satan. God is saying, I am more than anything Satan can throw at you. He is our all in all. So what is the good news? Well, basically speaking, it is the fact that our sins can be taken away, never to be remembered anymore, washed by the blood of Jesus Christ, the debt we owed God paid, his wrath tamed, turned away. What more could we ask? We're in a position, in the, if we have received God's salvation, to be people who if Satan said to God, look at that chap Martin Anderson. <laughs> What do you think God would say? And I'm not talking about earning something. I'm talking about as God sees it. He'd say, oh, Martin. Oh, I know Martin. Yeah, he's one of my children. I couldn't earn it. Not if I'd tried my whole life could I earn it. I have been forgiven. I have been redeemed. I have been reconciled to the almighty God by trusting in the saving grace of Jesus Christ. I expect you will have already gathered that I am not a fan of the idea of being come to our church brigade. <laughs> Because, as I said, the church is the body of believers. And on one occasion, many years ago, in preaching at a, a Pentecostal church, I said to them, what would you think if you came to church on Sunday morning and found that somebody had driven a bulldozer in one side of the church, gone straight through and out the other side. And I'm, I'm not joking. There was a gasp. And then they realised what I'd just done. I'd set a trap and it fallen straight into it. You see, they were thinking the church, the building. We are still the church if the buildings are taken away from us, if we haven't got anywhere to meet, we are still the church because we are the body of Christ. And it's important that we grasp that. But it's a terrible thing to try and shake off this idea of the church as a building. But the church is certainly not a denomination. There are no denominations in heaven at all. In the same way, there are no unbelievers in heaven. And as someone once reminded me, there aren't any unbelievers or atheists or agnostics in hell. 
The difference is they found out too late and there's no way back. We are privileged people. God has, as it were, invaded our space and brought his salvation and confronted us. He has provided the sacrifice. And it is the only way. Salvation is through Jesus Christ and his sacrifice alone. May I remind everyone that um, Christianity is not a religion. We are not competing with dead religions, any of them. We are talking about perfectly ordinary human beings, sinful people who God has reached out to. We have a personal relationship with God. How? Through the new life being offered by Jesus Christ. By accepting that only by putting our trust, which is an alternative word for faith, in Jesus and his sacrificial death and repenting of our sins, only that way can we be born again. This is what is happening when anybody accepts God's free offer of eternal, or sometimes referred to as we saw today, everlasting life. It cannot be earned, it cannot be bought, it is God's free gift. Now may I bring a warning to unbelievers the decision on where we spend eternity is made in this life. Whilst we are still living, it's a fallacy to think that the decision is somebody like St. Peter looking over the wall with a big book and the person turns up and they, he says, who are you? Oh, I'll look you up. Oh, I... I found you in the book or I haven't found you. It's rubbish. It's a fallacy. A demonic lie. It has nothing to do with anybody else. The decision is between God and man and woman or the child. And the decision is made in this life, not when this life is over. The moment we breathe our last any unbeliever is lost for eternity. There's no second chance. The idea that our good deeds and our bad deeds are weighed in a scale and uh, oh, it might be, yeah, touch and go. No. The sole criteria is what have we done with Jesus? Have we accepted him? as our Lord and Saviour, because if we haven't, and we've heard the gospel message, if we haven't, then we've rejected him. It's a terrible thing to turn away from Almighty God. The fact that the decision is made in the here and now, in this life, is what I want to just dwell on. Because it's made solely on whether or not we have repented and accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour. That alone, nothing else. And what I will just say to you is if you have not taken that step of faith and accepted God's gracious offer, do it now. Wherever you are, do it now. You know not what tomorrow brings. Do it now. Do not delay. A warning. No one fools Almighty God. 
His salvation is clear. There's no other way. We cannot come as part of a group. It's no good getting our name on a church register and thinking, oh, they're all right, I'll be okay. No, we come one at a time before God. And he knows. He knows all things. Do not delay. If you are challenged by the Holy Spirit, do not take any rest before you make your peace with God because your eternal destiny depends on it. And finally, I will address believers. The born again believers. Members of the true church. Those whose scripture refers to as being called out. We read in Romans chapter 8 verses 28 to 30. Those who I identify with a new life in Jesus Christ. Now, there's a very handy piece of scripture to remember. I was first introduced to it not long after I was born again when we had the Billy Graham Crusades in the 1960s. And it is in 1 John chapter 5 and verses 11, 12 and 13. It covers quite a bit, but the key thing is that you may know there's no hit and miss. The idea that you can be born again and lose your salvation is not correct. It's due to a misinterpretation of scripture and people confusing our works with our salvation. We all, in reality, fall short on our works. But our salvation is God's salvation on his term. It is a finished work and there's no argument about it. If it wasn't, somebody is going to have to explain to me what everlasting and eternal do mean. Because Jesus used them in that context. He says, has everlasting life, has eternal life. I either have or haven't. If Jesus says I have, that's good enough for me. So if you feel as Satan will certainly cause you to, that you have fallen short and somehow or other God's saying, I don't know, I've given up on this one. No, God never gives up. God has his plans and purposes. We may fail to achieve, as I'm sure most of us do, what God wants. But God will never turn us away. Jesus said it himself. He said all that the Father gives him will come to him. That you may know that you have eternal life. I speak here to myself as well because we move on to another topic and that is witnessing. What Jesus said there in Matthew chapter 28 verse 19. But first of all, I'll just refer you to the Old Testament, the prophet Ezekiel and chapter 3. It talks about a watchman. And the message of it is, if the watchman sees the danger coming and doesn't sound the alarm, if people suffer loss, he gets the, the blame. That's the kernel of it, if you like. But the principle still applies to us. You see, 
in being witnesses for God, we are, in effect, watchmen for those who are not. The other side of the watchman was that if he did sound the alarm and people said, oh, no, I don't believe it, it's a false alarm, carry on business as usual, if they suffered loss, he was absolved from that because he had warned them. And the thing is that this whole message of witnessing isn't about keeping a score. It's about warning people. You have a choice. Either go God's way or Satan's. If you don't go God's way, it's Satan's. There's no third way or anything like that. We've been born again if we've accepted Jesus Christ and we have a duty, as we saw in Matthew chapter 28, to tell people the good news. And if we do not do so, we'll have to answer for it to Almighty God because that's where the order came from. We'll have to answer for it, for not doing what God said. And I put it in that way because I'm sure everyone will have noticed that there isn't a single instance in the whole of the Bible of God saying, please. He told Moses to go back to Egypt, talk to Pharaoh. He gave similar sorts of instructions to people like Elijah and the other prophets. And here, Jesus has given us one. It isn't a request. It doesn't require a please. A please. What it is, is an order. It is a command. And commands are given to be obeyed. And if we don't, we have to give an answer. It is a command to go and spread his word to the lost souls all around us. We have no choice. It is not an option. We must obey. And I remind the unbelievers, those seeking, those who do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour, to this time you've heard of God's gracious gift of eternal life. It's now up to you. Will you submit to Jesus? Will you tell him that you want to turn from your sin and follow him, acknowledging him as Lord and Saviour? I sincerely hope you will. But just one thing. Don't think that you have to live this life on your own. Seek out a Bible-believing church which preaches the gospel, which teaches to build you up. And do not get entangled with liberal churches and churches which just peddle their traditions because they will not be of any use to you. Let the Bible, God's holy word, be your guide and your instructor for the rest of your life. The scripture tells us, and this is going back to the prophet Isaiah, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Will you do it?